Well, Apple's iPad has a new rival this morning. Amazon has revamped its Kindle e-reader and launched the so-called Kindle Fire, a multi-purpose full-colour tablet. At half the size of the iPad, the Kindle Fire was being touted as a worthy competitor before it was even released. Well, for more on whether Apple's dominance on the tablet is now waning, we're joined by technology author Mike Daisy. He is currently in Sydney performing a monologue on the Apple founder called The Agony and Ecstasy of Steve Jobs. And... Uh, uh, many thanks for joining us this morning. Before we get to that other topic, uh, the Kindle Fire, what do, you, what do you know of it and do you think it is going to be a worthy competitor? Well, you know, it's important to understand that uh, the Kindle Fire is made by Quanta, just as the iPad is made by Foxconn. We think of them as being made by uh, American companies, but really they're made by Chinese manufacturers and they're made by children under massively horrendous labor conditions. So substantially, the two tablets are identical in how they're produced. And uh, we're, we're seeing, uh, uh, we have some vision uh, right now of a very Steve Jobs-like unveiling of this new tablet. Um, because Steve Jobs has been a real master, hasn't he, at sort of manipulating the media into believing that his products really are just absolutely essential to our lives. Well, he's very good at um, at a, a kind of showmanship. Um, Apple, their design tends to reinforce that. Um, they tend to have very sleek, very elegant designs that, um, that then, you know, are reinforced by the fact that they, um, that they go so well with these introductions. But, um, you know, the, the choice of other technology companies to adopt those tropes isn't surprising. There isn't a lot of original thought in the technology field. So when they see something working, people photocopy it. Mm. Let's look at your journey for a little bit because you've gone through sort of both. You've gone through working in Silicon Valley and being uh, loving, in fact, all this technology. Well, I worked at Amazon uh, in Seattle and, um, uh, and, you know, I've always loved technology and I think that um, the love of technology is not necessarily a terrible thing. You know, we, uh, even the basic stone tools that we all had once were technology. It's really the the birthright of the human race. The way technology is created, however, is, um, is of, should be of serious concern to all of us. And uh, talking of that now, Amazon's new uh, Kindle Fire apparently is going to be priced at around the $200 mark, which would be uh, very much cheaper than the iPad. Your issue is, as you were saying earlier, uh, how cheap can they go? And is it the consumer expectations that they get cheaper that are driving um, perhaps where they're being made and the conditions they're being made in? Well, I think consumer expectations grow out of the massive profit margins that the uh, companies realize. Like those expectations exist because consumers are fed every year a brand new crop of electronics for their consumption. And so people are expected to upgrade endlessly. The odds that most people watching this program right now need the new tablet as soon as it comes out is uh, minuscule. Almost no one actually needs a new tablet, but people want one because it's sexy and cool. And so uh, people go out and get them. And one of the reasons that people are completely blind to how they are created is that the corporation's done a very effective job of carving us off from how they are actually made. And I think if people understood that, they might view them differently. Take us through the, the, the trip that you made to Foxconn where the iPad is made. And this is this, this monolith. It's, it's almost like a city where these uh, products uh, come out. Oh, yes. I'm in the factory where, um, uh, where a lot of Apple products are made in Shenzhen uh, has 430,000 workers in a single enormous factory. And there are other factories across the landscape making all of your electronics, all the electronics of the first world. And um, in my time there, I stood outside the gates of Foxconn and interviewed hundreds of people. And I met many workers who were working on Apple products uh, Sony products, Nokia products, all the different products that are made in lines right next to each other. We always imagine they're all made in separate plants, but really they're made in the same places. And those workers were often 15 years old, 14 years old, 13 years old, uh, working on lines, uh, doing repetitive motions until the joints in their hands disintegrate. You have obviously had this change of heart about it because you've seen these conditions, but aren't you sort of facing this sort of inevitable tide? You've got young children growing up expecting to have these kind of uh, tools at their disposal forever. 
Well, uh, that kind of argument is ridiculous. I mean, frankly, people's expectations should be moderated by some sense of human rights. I mean, uh, if it's acceptable to work people in a fascist country like China to exploit them in this way to make our products, why not just hire prisoners? Or why not enslave people and keep them to make our products and then they'd be really cheap? I mean, um, this idea that um, there's an inevitable tide where things must grow cheaper and cheaper and cheaper is a byproduct of the same kind of thinking that brought us to this point. Mark Daisy, many thanks for your time. Thank you.